There's a word. Checked in the hospital and had the various tests and uh, it proved that uh, I'd had a small stroke. Come on over here. Yep. If you'd like to sit up on the bed. Terry's case fascinated scientists at University College in London. So if you just want to lie back down. Okay, look here. Excellent. In the neuroscience department, a team led by Kathy Price used an MRI scanner to discover which region of Terry's brain had been damaged. They hoped it would help to pinpoint the parts of the brain normally involved in reading. You can see it um, here, so we've got three angles of the brain here. Where this blue cross is here, there's a big black mark. So this area of his brain has been damaged, and you can see if you look on the other side, in his right hemisphere, this is what it should look like. And so what, what is the effect of that? He's seeing it as a child would see a word. They can see the word, they can see that the letters are there, but it doesn't make any sense to them. So it seems what's happened with uh, Terry is that he's, 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 he can see the word, but he can't take that visual information forward. It's been disconnected. Is this, then, the brain's reading centre? To find out, Cathy sought out other people who had developed reading problems after a stroke. Careful observations showed that their difficulties were intriguingly varied. A patient might look at the word yacht and say um, ship. So there's no connection between the visual <laughs> in the word yacht and the word um, ship. And then there are other patients still who have a different strategy. They'll look at the word yacht and they'll go yacht, yacht. Um, and they won't ever guess that it's, it's yacht. And for them, they, they are um, successfully trying to sound things um, out, but they're never getting to what the, the, the meaning of the word is. When Cathy scanned the brains of these stroke patients, each with a subtly different reading handicap, she discovered that many different bits of their brains had been damaged. This suggested that reading involves more than one small part. So a lot of areas of the brain uh, are involved um, and they're all integrating together to transform visual information into auditory information, into motor information and into the meaning. And of course when you read a word and you can do so in you know, a few hundred milliseconds, you have no idea how hard your brain um, is working. So there's no single reading centre, but a highly complex network, a cerebral internet. Cathy's work laid bare an intricate reading kit of parts. In tiny fractions of a second, the brain must decipher letters and connect them to sounds. Another part of the brain connects sounds and letters to meaning. Yet another stream of signals fires up parts of the brain that control the movement of our mouths and tongues, even when we're reading silently. If a single one of these connections is broken, as it is in Terry's brain, the system gets jammed. You may see letters but not a word, or read a word and not know what it means. And what is just as remarkable is that every part of our reading kit was originally designed to do something else. There are no areas of the brain that only respond to reading. So all the areas that are reading are also involved in recognizing objects in speaking. So in order to read, it's the connections between the visual inputs and the component sounds that need to be linked together. So this doesn't involve any new brain regions. What it involves is stronger and more efficient links. <laughs> So how do our brains grow these intricate reading circuits? These children are about to embark on a remarkable journey, the same one our ancestors took when they invented the alphabet 5,000 years ago and that Terry has taken in reverse. Brains must learn how to break up a single word they can hear into tiny building blocks and then link those sounds to the letters they see on a page and finally put it all back together again.
For these young brains, forging links between sound and alphabet is one of the biggest learning challenges they'll ever face. And for new readers, one language is particularly tricky. I think English is very tough to learn to be literate in. Most of the world's languages have syllables like um, you might find in the word baby or cocoa. They're just a consonant sound, a vowel sound, a consonant sound, a vowel sound. Whereas in English, we have very complex syllables. We have syllables like stamp or break or bridge, where you've got lots of sounds in that single syllable. So a child learning to be literate in English has to first of all represent that package of sound very clearly, which is the phonological side. And then they also have to learn which bits of those sound packages correspond to alphabetic letters when the letter sound correspondences keep varying. But perhaps making them do that extra bit of work is also good for the brain. Certainly um, in these kind of brain imaging studies you can see that extra architecture is built up by a brain learning to read in English. Now quite what that means psychologically isn't clear, but yes, the task is more complex and the brain responds by building up a more complex system in order to cope. And as with those London cabbies, the more time we put into practicing, the stronger the connections grow and the better we get at reading. Ready back again? We can make an analogy with your muscles, that we might have the same muscles, but a bodybuilder will build up their muscles so that they're bigger um, than, than somebody who wasn't a bodybuilder. Um, and likewise with the brain, you can see that when you become good at a particular skill, you can actually see the, the brain structure changing and, and growing to accommodate the new skill. And likewise, if you give up on a skill, you can see the brain shrink um, back down again. In other words, use it or lose it. The reading brain is a precious thing, and to keep it on top form, it must be maintained. According to a professor of English literature here at Liverpool University, there's no more powerful way of doing that than tackling the masterpieces of our tough mother tongue. And he's looked to brain science to show why. Davis has taught generations of students how to read and understand Shakespeare, one of the most challenging and innovative writers in world literature. Phil became fascinated by what was sparked inside his brain when it encountered some of Shakespeare's most testing inventions. A father, says this speaker, and a gracious aged man, have you madded? Not made mad, but that sudden electrical charge of turning what is an adjective into a verb at one shot. Or look at this one from Coriolanus. Coriolanus says, this last old man, whom with a cracked heart I have sent to Rome, giving him no favours, loved me above the measure of a father, nay, godded me even. Now this time we formed a verb not from an adjective, but from a noun. And I put it to you, that is more primal, more exciting, more electric than um, deified me, the Latinate, or made a god of me. This is sudden, compressed electric. So having felt these uh, almost visceral effects yes. in reading Shakespeare, yes. what made you turn to um, a scientist? To I wanted to know more about what was happening to me. Um, this is not unusual. In the play itself, in Lear, Lear grabs hold of his head, oh Lear, 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 beat at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out, oh let me not be mad, not mad. So he's trying to get hold of his head and I wanted, as I think we all do, to get hold of, to grasp what was going on inside. So I took, knocked on the door of a, of a neuroscientist and said, my instinct is that these shapes in front of our eyes have an effect on the shapes behind our eyes. How can I test this? Thank you very much. Phil, oh, that's oh. right. I'm going to strap you up, make sure you don't run away. That's very nice. Phil turned to Dr. Guillaume Thierry at the neuroscience department of the University of Bangor. Straps up the cap down. Let's measure the head. Huh? Rather large, actually, Guillaume, I have to say to you. You know, the size of the brain doesn't predict anything. <laughs> 